Welcome to Fire Engineering's Hump Day Hangout. Today we're going to, we have a great show for you today. We have Dave, and Dave, I don't want to mispronounce your name, and it's, it's my dyslexia, it always comes in, so, so if you could just pronounce your name for our listeners, I really appreciate it. Absolutely, Frank, not a problem. Dave Shostokas. Dave Shostokas. So Dave has written for Fire Engineering. He's been to FDIC in the front row to listen to Bobby Hall and talk. And he's somebody that I consider a constitutional scholar, but he's a constitutional attorney. And he's also running for attorney general for the great state of Illinois. Now, on this show, we cover politics and we've had some Democrats on. We've had Senator Murphy. We had Victor Angry from Prince William County on. So it's nice to have a Republican, because I'm usually, I'm the Republican in the conservative, so I'm usually talking to Democrats. So it's really nice to talk to somebody who's a conservative and somebody who's so well-spoken and who understands our founding documents. Um, Dave wrote a book, Constitutional Sound Bites. There's a couple editions. I'll have him tell you about it. But what it does is it allowed a firefighter to read and kind of really bring a basic understanding of our founding documents and how they're so critical to today. So, Dave, I'm going to let you introduce yourself and then we're going to get to talking about the First Amendment. We're going to talk about the Constitution, swearing an oath, protesting in front of justices' homes. And we'll also, unfortunately, talk a little bit about crime and what happened in Texas and New York and going on around the country and how that affects the fire service. So Dave, welcome to the show today. It is an honor to have you on. And like I said, I've learned so much from you in your writings about the constitution, about the declaration of independence and firefighters, as you know, as being part of the executive branch, which a lot of firefighters don't even realize, they swear an oath to protect and defend the constitution. And as I often say is, well, if you're going to swear an oath to something, don't you think you should at least know what's in it and why it's there? So I think that's where your teachings, your writings and your run for the attorney general in the great state of Illinois um, can put all that in perspective. So if you could just tell us a little bit about yourself, um, the floor is yours. Terrific. Thanks so much, Frank. It's great to be with you and your audience. As you mentioned, I'm Dave Shostokas. I am a candidate for uh, Illinois attorney general, but I've done a few things uh, before this, and uh, one of one of which is uh, contributing with you and uh, analyzing the uh, firefighters' oath and how that does in fact come from Article Six of the United States Constitution. The Constitution affects us in ways in our lives that and touches uh, everybody every day in ways that they have no, uh, they almost have no idea of how it benefits us and helps us out. And certainly, uh, the oath of the firefighter is among them. And we, you and I did a did an article in Fire Engine together that was a that was a pleasure uh, having the opportunity to work with you on that uh, on that issue but the uh, you mentioned my books uh, constitutional soundbite is one uh, constitutional sound bites is one uh, there's 150 what we would call questions and answers about the constitution and I was don't diminish yourself that you as a firefighter could understand it's uh, really uh, <clears throat> it's really important that my mom was my major editor in that book because uh, she's, there's nobody that will tell you, Dave, this sounds too much like a lawyer, except maybe your mom, you know? And so uh, having mom uh, be my editor there and in the other book, uh, creating the Declaration of Independence that we uh, trace the uh, trace the travels of Thomas Jefferson, John Adams and Richard Henry Lee in the month before uh, the declaration is issued. I think both of those are very, very valuable to uh, folks in understanding uh, our founding documents. I do... Uh, presentations about all that. Uh, of more recent vintage, uh, in 2016, I was on the uh, part of the Trump Rubio uh, legal team in uh, Florida, and we've, we discovered about 150,000 illegally open ballots in uh, Broward County. And uh, there's, a, there's a story about that in uh, Miami Herald, if you ever care to Google Shostokas, S-H-E-S-T-O-K-A-S, and Miami Herald, you'll find out some of my adventures in uh, in 2016, more recently in 2020, I was uh, part of a group in Pennsylvania. I was there for about five weeks. I wound up going to court with uh, Mayor Giuliani in Williamsport, Pennsylvania. I also wound up in uh, in Gettysburg testifying before the uh, Pennsylvania Senate uh, Committee on issues regarding the irregularities in the 2020 election in Pennsylvania that I was uh, actually literally on the ground for and um, 
was able to was able to observe many of the things that went wrong in in Pennsylvania in 2020, and I testified before the Pennsylvania Senate. Uh, after that, I was uh, I did work in Georgia uh, on the uh, during the course of the Senate runoff, and I've consulted with the Arizona House uh, on the Arizona audit matters. While the Arizona Senate ran most of the ran the audit, um, the Arizona House uh, was interested in what their constitutional uh, status was in regards to uh, going forward with issues from the 2020 election. So we've been involved in uh, election law, I've been involved in election law uh, very, uh, very deeply. Um, during the course of the pandemic, I actually filed a lawsuit on behalf of a church in central Illinois, got the, uh, got the church open within two weeks when, uh, when the attorney general of the state of Illinois was arguing that the churches were non-essential, uh, which, was, uh, which was crazy uh, to do that. Uh, I currently am um, a lawyer for an organization called the Illinois Conservative Union, and we have a lawsuit pending against the State Board of Elections for uh, failing to um, provide the data necessary to main, see to it that the voter rolls are properly being maintained. So there's elections, there's religious liberty, uh, a variety of other uh, civil liberties we've been involved in. And as you noted, I've been talking about and writing about the Constitution and the, um, and the Declaration of Independence for a period of time. And I'm pretty sure that's how we, event we originally hooked up uh, regarding some of our writings. And I wound up with your invitation to FDIC, which was perhaps uh, two or three of the greatest days of my life uh, to uh, be able to participate and be with uh, people who clearly literally put their lives on the line for their fellow citizens and clearly love, the, love America and the country. But to see some of the some of the firefighter competitions was uh, just, uh, uh, you know, enlightening. And uh, my goodness, you cannot hear um, Bobby uh, Bobby speak and not walk away with a love for country and America and, and service. So um, that's some background. Bobby Bobby is unbelievable. And just a quick editor's note about FDIC: uh, call for presentations is open till June seventeenth. So if you're in Illinois, you got to make sure you vote for the primary June second. You said it was. June 28th is the June primary. June 28th and June 17th, you have to get your call in for presentations for FDIC. Um, let's just start with something that's been in the news that has been really disturbing to me. So we've seen a leaked draft opinion from the United States Supreme Court that's caused some social unrest. This is the first time that I can recall an opinion ever being leaked. But what I found equally as disturbing as the opinion being leaked that affects firefighters is that we've seen people protesting in front of justice homes. And let me be clear, this isn't a political thing. And that's one thing that I love about how Dave writes is he just, something's got to transcend politics. And Dave, I think, understands that. So it doesn't matter whether it was Sonia Sotomayor's home or Justice Clarence Thomas, we can't have people picketing in front of justices' homes in Virginia and in Chevy Chase, Maryland. It's everybody wants to have their day in court. And we don't ever want a justice, a judge, a member of the jury, a witness to be able to have people protesting in front of their homes. And there's an actual federal law and it's federal code 1507 and it's called picketing or parading. And what we're seeing is is that in Chevy Chase and in Virginia, the police are actually allowing individuals to peacefully protest in front of their homes without arresting them. That's wrong because then how does that bleed over into our everyday society when we're a juror or a witness? And even though there may not be a federal law against protesting in front of a citizen's home, there is something called common decency. And I think Dave would agree with me that the First Amendment enshrines your right to peacefully protest, not mostly pre peacefully protest, but actually peacefully protest. And we need to protect our judges. Our, we need to protect our republic by protecting our judges. And just so I could drive home that this isn't political, I believe it was in 2000. Don't quote me on the date. But somebody dressed as a delivery person and went to assassinate a Judge Salas, who was appointed by President Obama. And I believe she wasn't home, but they killed her son and wounded her husband. Thank God her husband lived, but she lost her son. We need to make sure that judges cannot be coerced or intimidated. And one of the things that 
uh, Dave's running on is to make crime illegal again. So how this affects firefighters is these are residential neighborhoods. And if you see that I worked in Bethesda Chevy Chase, the streets are real narrow. It's not the public square. It's not designed to accommodate a large crowd. So not only does it affect if you have a fire at the justice's home, but what if there's a medical emergency at the neighbor's home? I mean, this has a, a large impact on the entire neighborhood and firefighters definitely have to plan for contingencies if a protest becomes violent. But one of the things that we see across the country is when a peaceful protest becomes violent, sometimes the police give too much space. And now let's think of that poor business owner who loses their business, um, the poor people that live in the neighborhood who can't go shopping and end up with a food desert. But also it goes to the attorney generals and the prosecutors because often these individuals are not prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. We see the charges reduced. We see charges dropped on rioters, not peaceful protesters. And that affects the fire service on the very next peaceful protest that turns into a riot. So um, Dave, you're the constitutional attorney. Can you reconcile the balance between not picketing and parading in front of a justice judge or jury's home versus the peaceful protest that's guaranteed and enshrined in our Bill of Rights? Yes, absolutely, Frank. There's a considerable difference between uh, a peaceful protest and, and while they say that you have the uh, right to uh, petition the government for redress of grievances, they're talking about the political branches. When you uh, seek to re petition the government, you're talking about talking to the Congress, you're talking about talking to the executive, those folks that are in charge of executing and enforcing the law and creating the law. That's where your opportunity to have redress of grievances is. The uh, judicial branch, judicial branch is an entirely different, uh, different animal, if you will, and it should be apolitical. Uh, it should be deciding things based on the law, based on the decisions of the law that were made by the political branches and put in place to be enforced by the judicial branch. So there is no place for uh, rioting or not in rioting for petitioning a judge. Uh, all this is about, it's what they call an ex parte communication. The only thing judges are supposed to consider are things that happen inside the courtroom or through the actual judicial process, whether it be by filing uh, proper motions or papers, things of that nature. Uh, but judges are not supposed to uh, consider, not supposed to read the newspaper. Yeah, it's funny when they, if you watch juries, you mentioned jury trials. When the judge sends the jury out of the, out of the room for any reason, he says, don't. Uh, don't look at the internet. Don't read any papers. Don't uh, don't open any books. Don't do anything that's related to this because you're supposed to decide things on the law and the evidence that happens in this room. And that is the same situation for justices uh, when they are about to uh, make decisions in various capacities. So there's no place for that kind of activity. And you're right in terms of the ability for something like that to spill over to members of a jury. Uh, that uh, may be a very hot or very uh, contentious case that's going on in a, in a courtroom. People follow the juror home and then protest in front of the juror's house or demonstrate it one way or the other. This is, uh, that's illegal. It's called intimidation of a juror. And there's reasons for that because everybody is entitled to uh, their fair and uh, open and public trial. Uh, but the, the only way you're going to get that is if we isolate the decision makers from the pressures of politics. And uh, so the de decision makers in this instance, the judges, but in other instances, juries, are, the only way we can do that is if we protect them from interference in doing their duty from um, outside forces. And so this is, this is a difference. There, um, and of course, there's a variety of places where these kinds of things are illegal. You mentioned the federal statute. But uh, still um, on a private street, typically you need a permit to do something on a private street. There's all kinds of uh, things. And you, you talked about the consequences and the dangers of doing this on private streets. Uh, the dangers just not only to the residents, but to uh, the people that are in a position to respond to problems for the residents. So there's all kinds of reasons. And the, and the basic, basic premise of government in the first place is, in fact, to have a civil society where we can live out our life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. And uh, when you're uh, outside somebody's house, you're interfering with their life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. And so uh, 
there's a saying about uh, my, the, uh, my, ex- my right to extend my arm ends at the tip of your nose, you know, and so now you're getting to the tip of the justice's nose. Uh, and this is, uh, you, you've gone to the limit. And so it's not just there, but so there, every, all the rights have, um, have limitations on them. And this is, this is certainly one of them. So we hope, to, uh, we hope to see that people do not do that and would be properly arrested. You, we talked about, you mentioned the slogan for my campaign, make crime illegal again, uh, which is, while it's catchy, but strangely enough, we actually have a plan. You have a new, uh, you have a new attorney, there's a new attorney general in Virginia. Uh, Jason Mieras. And one of the first things that uh, Mr. Mieras did on his uh, first day was, if the local prosecutors will not prosecute these crimes, our office will. And people don't understand that there are 43 elected uh, attorneys general around the country, and they don't owe a duty to the governor or the government. Uh, They owe a duty to the people that elected them. And so uh, this is this is how we're going to conduct that office. Uh, we talked, you mentioned Chicago and passing, uh, Chicago has, is kind of infamous these days in uh, certain ways, more, uh, more famous for the uh, Justice Smollett uh, debacle than anything else. But that's uh, kind, of the, kind of the tip of the iceberg of things that do not get prosecuted that should be prosecuted. And when I become attorney general, we will have the ability to do that. When Kim Fox in, uh, in Cook County turns loose, people that the police uh, and in some instances, firefighters have put their lives on the line to help bring into custody uh, firefighters to help them do so safely and police to do so under, uh, under other circumstances and then gather the evidence to convict them and then have the prosecutors turn them loose on the street. That is just, uh, that's just an abomination of what civil society is supposed to be. This is, uh, we mentioned New York in passing. This man in New York that uh, died on the subway on Sunday, Mr. Enriquez, he was shot by a guy that had been arrested 19 times. 19 times? See, that's the one thing that that the public a lot of times kind of misses because we do want to be a second chance society. We want to be able to give individuals a second chance. But we see in shooting cases, in domestic violence cases where somebody is arrested time and time again they're on they're on their third you're saying 19th time and they're still allowing them to possess a weapon or not put them in jail where they belong you know i want proper due process i want an attorney general to not view the world through a political lens but to view it through the law and the constitution Uh, i mean how could somebody be arrested 19 times and not be prosecuted, especially when some of those arrests involved a firearm or a deadly weapon? Yeah, one uh, one did uh, involve an illegal possession of a weapon. Another was, in fact, a domestic violence matter. The other one uh, involved um, his possession of a stolen car. Uh, and though, oh, those three cases at the moment are still pending. Though he was out on the no cash bail system in New York. Uh, on those three cases, and uh, as opposed to being, so that's that's uh, that's the tra- every every murder is a tragedy. But to see a, a murder take place that was eminently preventable, this was preventable because this individual should the individual that did the shooting, Mr. Abdullah, should not have been out and about among the public, and this is. Um, this is the this is the problem, and this is what we want to do in terms of make crime illegal again. We, uh, you know, and the offices uh, of the attorney general. This particular office uh, uh, has been utilized to defend the government rather than to defend the people. I've got a case per- currently uh, where we've sued the board of elections, asking them simply to obey federal law and give us the data that we need to have to determine if they are keeping the voter rolls clean. Not not. It shouldn't be a big deal in a, in a regular society. But the attorney general of the state of Illinois, all we said was obey the law. And in the end, there's a stack of legal papers knee high that says uh, where they say, well, we don't have to. Uh, you know, with the attorney, this is where we've come to. The attorney general of the state of Illinois is telling the citizens that elected him that their government doesn't have to obey the law. This is the place to start uh, because when uh, when the government itself is not obeying the law, it creates a, it creates a culture of lawlessness uh, all across the all across the society. 
Well, we've and, seen uh, that we've seen that with violent crime in all of our cities, whether it's Chicago, New Haven, Camden, and now even spilling into the suburbs, is that there's a culture of crime now, and firefighters every day, EMS workers, and police officers are responding to more and more of these crimes, and it's almost like, and I say this, I'll put on a partisan hat. The left wants to try to lift everybody up, but you can't do that by holding them down. And there's some great people in these neighborhoods. There's a lot of great people. The majority of people are great Americans. They don't want the criminal or the individual dealing drugs that has a firearm on them getting arrested and being right back out on the street. And I think a lot of the times the public conflates the issue. They think like no cash bail is or that that bail reform that they did across the country. They think that means if somebody got caught with marijuana and it's not a violent interaction that they're released back out. But they're releasing across the country individuals that have committed violent crime or accused of committing violent crimes. Is that correct? That's exactly correct. And uh, what you were saying about, um, you know, people generally, I've had the opportunity during the course of campaigning to talk to uh, groups of as many as 300 uh, black pastors in a, in, a, in a black church on the uh, south side of Chicago. I do not tailor a message any differently for a group like that than uh, uh, West Suburban uh, West Suburban soccer moms. Everybody, and they're, everybody's people, Frank. Everybody wants to be safe in their community. Everybody has value and nobody wants crime in their neighborhood. I don't know anybody who wants crime in their neighborhood. Yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, so it's, it's just, it's, it's maddening that, uh, you know, these prosecutors that are failing to prosecute things are, are running their offices on this theory of proportionality that uh, where they think that, OK, well, we've arrested enough uh, people of this demographic. And so now we're not going we're going to turn loose the rest of them or, uh, you know, we've arrested enough people of this demographic. So we're going to turn them loose. The fact is, is what needs to be done in a courtroom is to say, OK, this is this crime. This is this individual. This is these are these facts. This is the history of that person. We will set bail accordingly to those kinds of traditional traditional methods in determining whether somebody's a danger to society, whether or not it's appropriate, whether or not they're likely to show up in court to answer the cases, uh, answer the charges against them. Those are there's traditional ways to measure these things, but they're all based upon making that decision upon. These, this set of facts with this person, these victims, this, uh, this allegation, this, this background, not the fact that, oh, he is of a particular uh, demographic group and we have enough of those folks in jail, so this person should go free. No, that, that's insanity. This, uh, running, these, uh, running these things on statistics and studies, you see all these, uh, all these uh, progressive prosecutors saying, well, there's, this study shows this and this study. None of, that's all balderdash. All the thing that all that matters is this case at this moment, at this time, with this victim, and this this defendant, and the facts that support uh, the accusation and the background. And those are how you should make these decisions, not on the fact that he's a member of a particular group or not. Yeah, everybody has value, and it should be just about the facts of the case and the merits of the case. And that's what everybody should want from their legal system. It's not a political the legal system shouldn't be political. It should just be based off the rule of law and the Constitution. Um, let's just talk a little bit about the Bill of Rights uh, real quick. So one of the things that, I, that I've learned as I, you know, reading more and more is that in the Constitution, when they talk about the government, they generally talk about the founders talked about powers. And when they in the Bill of Rights, when they talk about individuals, they talk uh, more about rights. Can you can you kind of speak to that? Because sure, absolutely. Because we have uh, there's confusion in language regularly. Uh, people talk about things like states' rights. You know, when you hear somebody say so, states have no rights. You know, only people have rights. Uh, you know, governments don't have rights. Governments have authorities or power that were granted to them by the people for the purpose of protecting the people's rights. That's uh, that's why government exists so that we can exercise those rights. Um, and so that's a, that's a significant difference where even when you talk about rights, uh, you talk about the first rights in the, uh, in the first five rights in the, in the First Amendment, speech, religion, press, 
uh, those uh, those kinds of things, assembly, uh, redress of grievances, those are things that a right is something people are born with. It's not it's not something that is given to them by government. It's not something that government can take away. And strangely enough, it's also something you can't even give up. That's what that's what the term inalienable means. You know, it's not given to you. It can't be taken away. And by the way, you can't give it away. You can't trade it away. And you can't um, vote it away either. Right. And that's conflated. Right. You cannot vote or you cannot vote it away and you cannot have the uh, have somebody else voted away for you. Uh, and uh, which brings us to voting, even voting uh, when they say about voting rights. That's a misuse of the, that's a misuse of the term. You know, so a right is something that uh, attaches to a to a to a little baby. A little baby has a right to life. You know, that 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 attaches. But to vote, you have to be at least 18 years old. You have to be at least a citizen. In many places, you have to prove residency. There are requirements. So if there's requirements to do something, it's not the same. It's not in the same category as a right. Uh, you know, a driver's license, you have to be a certain age. You have to pass a test. You have to get a piece of paper. Uh, you know, driving is a privilege. There's no right to drive. And so there's a lot of things that we um, make misnomers about. And one of the things is to say that the government has a right to do something. Government has no rights to do anything. Government only has authority, which we grant uh, to them. And that's, uh, and that's one of the strange, strange things in terms of, like I said, in one of the very first things I would do as attorney general is, in fact, see to it that the government follows the law. Uh, this, is, this, is, this is something that... Uh, uh, governors and uh, people across the uh, across the country in the last two years have not been doing. They have, with impunity, pretending that the law is what they want it to be, as opposed to what the law actually is. And this is uh, this is a problem. And the people that are uh, the people that are in the best position to do that are, in fact, the attorneys general across the country. They're the ones that I, you know. I'm, <clears throat> an interesting thing that I talk about when I talk about. Uh, the governor and the attorney general, the relationship there, if the governor and the attorney general disagree about the law, guess who wins the argument? The chief. attorney general, because uh, the attorney general is the chief law enforcement officer and decides whether or not something goes to court or does not go to court. So they're, they're making decisions even before the judges do uh, and say, let, let's say here in Illinois, Mr. Uh, governor Pritzker overstepped his legal authority in issuing mandates. Uh, well, which, by the way, there is no uh, legal term mandate in American law. Uh, it doesn't exist. It, it's very irritating when somebody talks about mandates because there is no such thing. That's only something that a king does. It's not something that a uh, elected official of the uh, of the governments of a republic do. So well, we've there's seen, no such thing. Plenty of mandates uh, across the country that defy law. You know, one of the basic mandates was the first time during COVID I flew to FDIC. And they said, wear your mask for, you know, everybody's protection and your protection. And they, the flight attendants were enforcing the rules and they were saying, oh, somebody's mask is into their nose. They were threatening to throw somebody off. And then, you know, 20 minutes into the flight, they said, okay, COVID, everybody just, COVID's gone now. Take your mask off and eat. What? Wait, wait, you know, how did the American people get so fooled by this? I mean, to me, that was just like such a, you know, we look at the churches and all the things that happened where it was inexcusable. But I mean, it just showed what a farce it was. It was so you had to wear your mask. But as long as you were eating, the virus didn't know it. it yeah, and, and just on a, on a side. Like uh, I always got a super jumbo bag of uh, peanut M and M's when I was on a flight, and um, I'd have the mask off and I'd just have one M and M at a time for two hours, and I never had to really put on the mask. Uh, no, nope. one of the things that I want to bring up is that, and correct me if I'm wrong, and I think I've learned this from your book, but in the Declaration of Independence, in the Constitution, and the Articles of Confederation, the word democracy isn't mentioned once. Is that correct? That's absolutely correct. No, democracy is not mentioned once, and it's and that's on purpose that they um, purposefully avoided that term because um, democracy would ultimately uh, they uh, the the founders considered that to be uh, kind of synonymous with mobocracy. 
that is, uh, you know, the best, uh, the best example comes from Ben Franklin. If you've got uh, two wolves and a lamb voting on what we're going to have for dinner, that's democracy. Uh, you know, the, and apparently the lamb loses, the lamb gets to be dinner, you know, even though he lost it to that was a democratic vote, right? Uh, the, the wolves voted, the, the lamb voted, the lamb lost. And so the lamb was dinner. And so that's and why this, it was so important that the constitution gave us the structure of the checks and balances and the different branches. And even our traditions of our Senate holding to those 60 votes is goes to having a Republic to protect minority rights. Would you, is, am I way off? No, you're not way off at all. The whole idea there, Frank, is to prevent, is to protect minority, as you say, minority rights, but not minorities in the terms that we use it today. It had nothing to do with uh, gender or race or, or uh, these immutable characteristics that go along with being born, but rather minority of thought, uh, rather the ability to practice your religion, even if somebody didn't like your religion, assuming, you're, assuming it didn't include things like human sacrifice or or other kinds of things that interfere with somebody else but it, they're they're there to protect minority of thought the uh constitution the institutions that are created around it are inherently anti-majoritarian they are anti uh, key, they are anti being ruled by the majority because that way because if in fact we are ruled by majority if anything is uh 50 plus one then uh, we actually have a tyranny uh that is uh, run by uh, run by Whoever the 50% plus one had declared to be the dictator. And this is, a, and we are, we are structured to avoid those circumstances and to allow everybody the opportunity to exercise their personal thoughts and personal beliefs. And Rand put, probably put it best that the smallest uh, minority that, is, that ever existed is the minority of one. And if you do not believe in protecting the rights of one person, you do not believe in protecting the rights of any person. And so this is, a, this is really, really important. It is, a, it is designed not to, not to express the will of the majority, but to go through a boiler, uh, boiler and kind of a melting pot process to come out with something that, generally speaking, the whole, whole country can live with. And uh, this, was a, this was a problem because up to uh, 1787, no republic had existed beyond a small city states in, uh, in Rome and Greece that uh, had just a few people uh, working like, like small towns in New England uh, that still have, uh, still have uh, town hall meetings and still uh, vote uh, based on everybody in the community. When you get beyond 15, 20 people, it gets to be a bit unwieldy. And then, so you wind up with the uh, representative kind of uh, Republic. It's not a right, you know, you can call it a representative democracy, but that's an oxymoron. Because a democracy, simply by virtue of its definition, is 50% plus one. But if you have a representative a representative group, representative republic between uh, the general populace and the making of law, you are now into a republic. You're not into a democracy. We are not a democracy. We've never been a democracy. Um, and uh, But what we are is a situation where we have the uh, contributions of the people. We are self self-governing people because we have the opportunity to select our representatives and have them act on our behalf. And when they don't act on our behalf, theoretically, we get rid of them, which is why elections are critical. Uh, and protecting our elections are critical. Uh, this, is, uh, this is very, very important. I, I still, uh, from time to time, I get the question about who won or should we overturn the election of 2020? And ultimately, we did not allow the legal system to play out and determine actually who the actual winner was. Everybody, it was so important for so many people to get it done quickly rather than to get it done right. And this is, this is, the, this is the real problem with 2020 is they wanted to get it done quickly rather than get it done right. I, uh, there's, a, uh, there's a sheriff in uh, central Illinois in a town called uh, Decatur is the name of the city. The uh, county is called Macon County. He uh, lost in November 2018, theoretically, by 99 votes. And I won't go through the whole legal history, but in 2021, June 21st, two and a half years after the election, the rightful winner of the November 18 election was sworn into the office. It took two and a half years, but they got it right. And uh, that's, that's the important thing about elections is to get them right. Not, not fast, but right. 
And so um, this is this is the issue. I'm a, a, on elections and I don't want to dwell too much on elections, but something that I, that I, I want to bring up is that we hear an awful lot about voter ID. You know, we have requirements. You want to make sure it's one person, one vote. And it, the media only says it just like it's only like they never seem to get into the question because I've never seen a voter ID drive. I've never seen uh, groups of people going out to sign people up to get an ID so they can buy a beer, so they can fly on a plane, so they can participate in society. But yet there seems to be something political about showing your ID when we show our ID for everything. But we and I don't know anybody who doesn't have an ID or doesn't have a license. And if there is a underserved community, you would think that that would be a priority to get them an an ID so they could enjoy life as we have in society today. Um, Can you can you speak to is there something that I'm missing on voter ID? I don't think so. I've never heard the uh, heard the thought about having an ID drive uh, that uh, people should have ID drives in communities, and there and and there's there's good reason that your uh, community activists should do such a thing, because you're right. Those things uh, an ID allows participation in the greater society, not just not just voting. Uh, voting would be uh, would be nice, but yeah, you need an ID. You need an ID to get on an airplane. You need an ID to in these days. Many to go into going to high rise buildings. Uh, it's very often uh, you know, there's so many places where they require it in life that having a voter ID drive for underserved communities when it comes to that seems like it would be really reasonable because the state I hear this state you know not everybody has or wants a driver's license so they make alternative um, state identifications. Uh, why not have a state ID drive? Uh, that's a that's a wonderful that's a wonderful. I went to the Frank. doctor's office the other day, and the first thing they did was photocopy my ID and my insurance card so I could get medical care. Um, it's just an ID is part of the fabric of our society. Um, one thing when talking about the Constitution is some people think that it can change over the years, and I kind of go back to what Scalia said: is the Constitution's dead. And how I explain that to firefighters is they say you have a collective bargaining agreement at work or you have as a volunteer, you have policies and procedures in your volunteer department. That letter is dead. Now, that doesn't mean that it can't be amended, just like the Constitution. There is a process to amend the contract. There is a process to amend your policies and procedures. But you just can't on a whim say, well, no, that's not what they meant back then. It has to go through an actual process. Can you speak to that a little? Yeah, that's absolutely correct. And that's the situation with not just the Constitution, when uh, any law, contractual documents, like you're, uh, like you're saying, all the, the, always the effort is always to determine what the document meant at the moment it was written by the people who adopted it. Uh, and then if you want to change it, there's always a process to, uh, to change or amend, as you say. And that goes for the Constitution. It goes for a, a statute. It goes for treaties. It goes for contracts. Uh, it, goes for, it goes for everything that people commit to writing. Uh, when it goes, to, it goes to somebody's will, uh, you know, but after they pass, that's a fair example. When, um, the will is interpreted at the moment that the guy signed it, uh, not, not somebody saying, well, this is what uh, Uncle Joe meant uh, before he died. He really wanted to give me that car. Uh, he, he just forgot to do it. You see where, you know, he didn't mention the car. When he didn't mention the car, that means he meant to give it to me. Uh, but no, no, Uncle Joe didn't mention the car because uh, and we have to take him at his word because he intended not to mention the car. And so that's the, that's the same thing with the Constitution. They did not mention any place um, anything about abortion. There is no word about abortion in the, uh, in the Constitution which uh, meant that they left it up per the Ninth and Tenth Amendment to the states uh, to uh, make a determination on, the, on, the, on such su- subject matter. I don't oh, know if- Explain the Tenth Amendment because it's, it's an amendment. You know, everybody talks about the First Amendment and the Second Amendment, but very rarely do you hear a cogent conversation about the Tenth Amendment and what it means. So can you kind of enlighten our firefighters out there on what the Tenth Amendment is? 
Yeah, sure. Uh, one and the Tenth Amendment basically indicates. Of course, you have to look at the context of the entire Constitution, particularly Article One, uh, Section Eight of the Constitution. It outlines about twenty-five or twenty-six individual authorities of the federal government, and then you you see those authorities in the federal government. Then you go back. Then you go all the way to the Tenth Amendment, and Tenth Amendment indicates that anything not given to the federal government is reserved, not given to the federal government, nor prohibited to the states in terms of power or authority. It belongs is belongs to the states or the people uh, collectively. So when it doesn't say, um, it says it, it's silent about abortion, that means that the Tenth Amendment kicks in and says, yeah, this uh, this is an authority that belongs to the states. The states are the ones that can legislate on this subject matter. And so that goes... You- what you're saying is if this draft opinion comes to being the actual opinion on abortion, and it's important for our listeners to realize that you kind of got an inside look at how the Supreme Court operates, even though it's detrimental to the Supreme Court, but a draft opinion gets circulated around the court and that doesn't end up always being the final opinion. Um, I could equate it to if you look at a bill for a piece of legislation, you look at the first bill that doesn't mean that that's how that legislation is going to turn out if it gets voted into a law. There's a process that it goes through. But so if this draft opinion became the opinion of the land, it wouldn't ban abortion. It would bring the issue back to people who voted for their representatives in the state to cast a vote in their state legislature. Is that what you're saying? That's uh, that's exactly right on that, on that issue. Um, regarding the, you know, and it is not a final opinion. We don't know what the final opinion will, in fact, uh, encompass. If it turns out to be the final opinion or something like it, it will be the greatest give back of federal power that has ever been hap- that has ever happened in the history of the country since George Washington turned over his sword to the Continental Congress uh, when he did, when they were saying, "George, please become president or please become king." George walked in and said, no, here's my sword. I, I came, we, we fought the war, we won. I, I do not want to be king. We should not have a king. And this, in this instance, in 1973, with Roe, the uh, United States Supreme Court usurped and took power that always belonged to the people. And this court is proposing to give that power back to the people where it, uh, where it, for, where it belongs. And so that's kind, of a, that's kind of an exciting thing. You know, the the, the, the opinion is not really about abortion in any way, shape, or form, although they uh, cover that because everybody wants to hear about the policy. But the opinion is really about who gets to decide the question. And, you know, it, that's really what the opinion is about. And the Supreme Court says, you know what? We don't get to decide this. Everybody and every the folks that go around and say you know, nine old men are now uh, six men and three women or whatever the makeup currently is, shouldn't be deciding things that we do. Well, that's what the Supreme Court just said. They said, you know, they shouldn't be deciding this. And that's so, the, the Supreme, so the Supreme Court, they're not supposed to be politicians in robes that are unelected. They're supposed to interpret the Constitution, interpret the laws and ensure that the laws applied equally to every individual in the country. Would that be a fair statement? That's a fair statement. I we're, we're just uh, touch one one more minute on the on the uh, Tenth Amendment uh, <clears throat> and the value of the Tenth Amendment. And I think you could probably tell in more detail about this how this applies to firefighters. But you know, the Tenth Amendment uh, reserves certain kinds of things to regulate to the states. Uh, nurses. Uh, are, are not subject to any kind of federal regulation. All nurses get their get their nursing licenses from state authorities. The state authorities have what they call nurse practice acts that indicate what kind of training nurses need to have, what kind of things they need to do to maintain their license, continuing education, and whatnot. And we wound up, and so all those are regulated. All the nursing profession is regulated by fifty different individual state agencies across around the country. And we and have the nurses, same thing with we have the same thing with our EM. Every almost every firefighter out there is either an emergency medical technician or a paramedic, and it's not uh, dictated by national standards. There's actually a and, and Bobby Hall, and I wish he was here, maybe he'll come on in a minute, but Bobby's very passionate about this. There's are some that want to nationalize uh, EMS and nationalize the fire department. And the fact is what works in New Haven, Connecticut may not work in 
Los Angeles. And it's important that we have those where it's, if decisions are made closer to the people, the decisions tend to be better. Yeah, you're exactly right on that. And the end result of my, my point about nurses, the 10th Amendment and local regulation is that in every survey anybody can ever take, ever imagine, nursing is considered to be the most respected profession in the country of all the professions there are. And it, they're all the nursing profession is all regulated locally pursuant to the 10th Amendment. And that's the same situation that the reason why uh, EMTs and firefighters are regulated locally is in fact the 10th Amendment. And that allows you guys that are on the, on the line, uh, when you run into problems, then you can then you can go to the local regulators and say, listen, you guys imposed this on us, but it's not working. And uh, then uh, then we have 50, 50 laboratories, if you will. And the, the regulators of, among the states share this information with each other. And through this process of uh, 50 different sets of regulations, you wind up with essentially a model regulation that turns out to be the best that's tweaked for local conditions. And... Uh, this is just why the Tenth Amendment is so amazing, and why the whole uh, fifty republics uh, within the uh, within the United States of America is so amazing, because we wind up with these wonderful results like nursing, like EMTs uh, that are uh, regulated locally, but yet they still have the input and the knowledge of what what's being tried elsewhere, and so it always allows for improvement. And the problem with federalizing any of this stuff is you wind up with some bureaucrat sitting in an office in Washington, D.C. that never talks to anybody except uh, except his friends that uh, went to the same school as he did, uh, making a rule that across the country and thinking that it's, it's a great thing to do. And uh, so this whole federalizing, that's why we should probably not have a Department of Education at the federal government. Uh, there's no good reason for that. All that, 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 that interferes with what the school boards are doing and what the uh, parents are trying to achieve uh, locally for their own children. This is this is what the Tenth Amendment is all about, and that's the value of it to the country is uh, the local having the local control and the people that are closest to the the governments that are closest to the people are the ones typically that are most responsive and run the best. Now going back to the Constitution's dead, and we could amend it to make positive changes through a process. Um, we'd be remiss if we have a conversation about the Constitution without talking a little bit about slavery. And I always viewed the Declaration of Independence as a promise that was realized through the sacrifice of the Civil War to treat everybody as individuals, which led to the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment. Um, as a country, you can't look back, this is my own personal opinion, and a view history through the constructs of today. Things do change, but slavery was not an American institution, how people paint it. Slavery was part of a world construct at the time. And America started in 1776. Slavery was already part of that world construct. And while a lot of individuals look to Britain and say, well, the English ended slavery before America, if you look at the linear line of history, America ended slavery quicker than any other country in the world. The purpose of the Declaration of Independence, if they tackled slavery at that time, um, Jefferson actually wrote in a letter that the slavery issue was like holding a wolf by its ears. You couldn't safely hold it or safely let it go. While it's 100% wrong and we wish that human stain never happened. The fact of the matter is they were declaring their independence from Britain. They needed to get there so that we could finally get to the Civil War and amend the Constitution. But I think this is a great country. And I think Charles Krauthammer was one of the people that said it best is he was explaining to me that, yes, America has made mistakes, but so has every other country out there. But America changes and moves forward. And when we get back to the it's the, about the individual, that's when we succeed in this country. Can you speak to, to those amendments? Yeah, we'd be happy to. I, you know, something that's really, really missed that people don't understand, and, and it doesn't fit anybody's narrative for the most part, 
is that, of course, they in 1787, they're drafting the uh, Constitution uh, in, uh, in Philadelphia during the course of the Constitutional Convention. But the uh, Continental Congress was continuing to meet during the course of that time. And in 1787, the Constitutional Convention, or excuse me, the Continental Congress passed the Northwest Ordinance. And the Northwest Ordinance, at the same time they're writing the Constitution, was, uh, was to deal with the new territories that were inherited from England after the, after the end, of the, uh, end of the Revolutionary War in 1783. And so, but the interesting thing about the Northwest Ordinance, which originally was drafted by Thomas Jefferson, going back to Thomas Jefferson, he had drafted what became the Northwest Ordinance. The Northwest Ordinance abolished and prohibited slavery in all the new territories that were granted from England that were acquired from England and as a course of the Revolutionary War. Those territories would ultimately become Ohio, Michigan, Illinois, Wisconsin, part of Minnesota, uh, and Indiana. And those, uh, those states were the backbone of the North that ultimately abolished slavery in the country. So the roots of abolition of slavery took place in 1787 when they prohibited slavery forever and always in those new territories that were acquired from England. And it was Mr. Jefferson who wrote the, the Northwest Ordinance that abolished slavery in the new territories and who proposed actually in his constitution for Virginia that uh, no new slaves be uh, imported into Virginia. So it's not like it just happened overnight in 1864 uh, that uh, we, we passed the 13th Amendment that uh, would have in fact abolish slavery legally. The abolition of slavery actually started with the with the passage of the Northwest Ordinance in 1787. And of course, uh, Benjamin Franklin was in fact the founder of the Pennsylvania Abolition Society. Uh, so these guys were on the, in the end, they were on the right side of history in terms of the direction that they were putting the country together. Jefferson knew at the moment that he wrote, all men were created equal. He knew at that moment in time that there was an intellectual disconnect behind between the, into, be, between uh, slavery and the words that he was, the words that he was promulgating. He knew that at, the, at that moment and he did many, many things to push forward the abolition of uh, slavery at, at the, at, during the course of his lifetime. And so uh, it's just really, really sad that people, uh, you know, like you say, paint this as an American institution and paint this as uh, something that was old and was uh, ingrained in the country. The guys, that, the guys that put the country together set in motion, both through, as you say, the promise of the declaration, more importantly, or just as importantly, they, through the uh, legal creation of the abolition in the Northwest Territories. They went and there's a fellow by the name of Governor Morris, who in fact is uh, credited with the uh, actual writing of the constitution. And he wasn't he actually, a governor. No, his name was Governor. His name was Governor. He was a New York guy. Uh, but he was never a governor, no. Uh, but he was the actual penman of the Constitution, and he took great pains to never see that, not see that the word slavery was not in the Constitution, so that it would not ever be considered to have been constitutionalized, which all would, which would always allow for the abolition. If they had written into their, their or recognized it inside the Constitution, then uh, it would have taken a constitutional amendment to uh, allow. Uh, allow individual states to even uh, abolish slavery within their boundaries. So they, this, was, this was heavily on their minds. They knew, uh, they knew about the problem and they took steps. They took steps that they could, to deal with uh, something that was institutionalized. Uh, there was a political problem in terms of, uh, that you referred to in terms of uh, coming together to defeat Britain. And so uh, the folks where slavery was already illegal Kind of had to swallow the bitter pill of doing business with the with the people in places like uh, Georgia and Virginia and wherever where slavery was uh, legally established. Uh, but uh, so they had to. That, that was a, a devil's bargain that had to be made to create the country. And we're sorry we're sorry that they did that. But on the other hand, if they hadn't, I don't know that we'd have a country. Uh, so sometimes there's hard choices. But they moved forward on the abolition on many many fronts, even as early as we can, we can definitely don't denote 1787 
as the first place that they made a major place uh, abolishing slavery. And the 14th Amendment, if I'm correct, codified the Second Amendment for slaves, freed slaves, because if somebody is armed, they can be nobody's slave. Um, is that is that correct? I would uh, I would say that the 14th Amendment uh, did, in fact, take the Second Amendment and apply it to the states uh, that would prohibit the states from uh, interfering with the ownership of guns. And, you know, that's that's all very interesting to everybody. We have these uh, debates these days about uh, guns and gun control and everything like that. It's kind of interesting that seven, the Second Amendment was adopted in 1791. There was not a single Supreme Court case dealing with the Second Amendment until about 1935, it was Miller versus the United States. And that was the very first case. So for 145 years or so, there were no cases about the Second Amendment. That doesn't tell you that there were, were issues. What it tells you is everybody understood what it meant. Everybody understood there was no contention. Nobody was trying to rewrite the Second Amendment without that, without amending the Constitution. Everybody understood that people had the right to keep and bear arms. And our, our thoughts and prayers are out to the families of what just happened in Texas, but also what happens to an individual that gets shot and killed in Chicago on the weekend. Their life is no less valuable than when it happens to a bunch of kids. Anybody that's murdered, their life and liberty is taken at the hands of a criminal, um, you know, is, is serious. But myself and Justin McCarthy wrote an article for fire engineering. It was a commentary on a visceral response to gun control isn't the issue because firefighters are dealing with this gun control issue all the time. And one thing I just want to point out that was kind of forgotten to history is that as far as my research can tell, the largest loss of life in a school was 38 elementary school children killed and six adults were murdered and an additional 58 were murdered in Bath Township in Michigan by an individual who set off a bomb in the school. So where there's evil, evil will prevail. And the right to bear arms is, I think, is one of our fundamental rights. And if you go back to the founding, while the colonies stored cannon and powder, individuals always had their arms to go get that powder. That dates back to Benedict Arnold, who was a volunteer firefighter in New Haven, when Concord and Lexington happened, he took the Redcoats. They're actually in a painting by John Trumbull. It's a real powerful painting. It's a Benedict Arnold, while he was still a good guy in New Haven, he went to the powder house and they're dressed as Redcoats. And he's demanding the key to the powder house to take New Haven's militia to uh, fight in Lexington and Concord to help out the Patriots. And they all showed up with arms. They just needed additional uh, powder. So uh, weigh in on that a little bit. Well, certainly that's, a, in essence, you, you, you start out and that you're, you're talking a little bit really about that Justice uh, Scalia's uh, opinion and Heller uh, and how he uh, goes through the history of this situation. But when you come down to it, you can study history a lot, but if there's a right to life, there's a right to self-defense. The right to self-defense is meaningless on you, unless you have the, unless you have the skills and abilities and, uh, and assets to defend yourself in uh, terms of what kinds of threats may, may come upon you. And so uh, it just is an easy flow from the right to life that I believe everybody believes everybody has the right to life. Well, then you have the right to defend your life and you have the right to defend the lives of uh, those around you. So it's, it's really an easy jump. There's, there's one more issue that I want to, because we're at the witching hour, that I just want to hit real quick about the First Amendment, because I see it conflated in the media all the time. So with the First Amendment, it's for government, not for private business. But what we've seen now is the government using and directing private business to actually censor people. So therefore, does that fall under our First Amendment right when the government is using, utilizing a surrogate to deny somebody their right to speech? And I think that that's where it ties together. Can you can you speak on that? Absolutely. When uh, when somebody likes a, like a Twitter or a Facebook essentially executes government policy uh, or does things 
for the purpose of silencing speakers that the government wishes to silence, then there's a very strong argument that they are in fact acting as the government. And when they're acting as the government, then they're in a circumstance where they're subject to the restrictions of the First Amendment. Because of course, the First Amendment starts out with Congress uh, shall make no law, which uh, in indicates that it applies to government action. When the government recruits people to uh, act as actors in their behalf, then the actors that are acting on behalf of the government are subject to the same rules as the government, uh, the government itself. This is why uh, situations, uh, let's, say they, let's say they send an informant into a guy's jail cell and the, the informant is interrogating the guy in jail but he's actually acting as an agent for the police. That's a, clearly a violation of the guy's rights because he's entitled to, he's entitled to counsel, he's entitled to the right to remain silent. Uh, you know, so when you, that, that's, a, that's kind of an easy one when you send a guy, like a, send some other guy into another guy's jail cell and expect him to interrogate the guy while well, he's acting as a government agent under that circumstance and the uh, other fellow is entitled to the protections of the uh, Bill of Rights when the government is interrogating him. This is the same kind of analogy that would apply to what you're talking about when, uh, when, the, uh, when the government uh, through backdoor channels or however uh, determines that they don't want uh, people to talk about mm, Hunter Biden's laptop uh, and they, uh, and they, uh, they, they try and uh, silence folks from Hunter Biden talking about Hunter Biden's laptop. And that's actually the government policy and the, and their, your Facebooks and your Twitters are executing government policy, then they are, in fact, and should be subject to the uh, prohibitions of the of the First Amendment and other other aspects of the Bill of Rights. Dave, I cannot thank you enough for coming on with this great conversation today. And again, with our listeners, um, we're fire engineering is bipartisan. This is my own personal opinion, but we've had prominent Democrats on like Senator Chris Murphy from Connecticut, uh, Victor Angry. And now it's nice to have a, a fellow Republican on who believes that crime should be illegal and who understands and respects our founding documents. Um, Dave, if you could just uh, tell our listeners when the primary is and uh, if you want to give uh, 15 seconds to to wrap the primary, it up. Is, the primary is June 28th, Frank. Uh, the, uh, if people want to find out more uh, and, in fact, contribute, uh, we're at uh, Dave, the number 4ag.com. That's Dave 4ag.com. You can find out a lot there. And, uh, we need to talk to about 400,000 uh, citizens of Illinois between now and June 28th. And for uh, 27 bucks, we can talk to 3,000 of them. So uh, we'd love to have uh, we'd love to have the help at Dave for or for ag.com, and then we'll be working to restore uh, the rule of law here in the state of Illinois. But I, if I might in, mention that the Attorney General of the state of Illinois has specific duties for keeping elections clean, and if I'm in the uh, if I win the office, uh, then people will rethink what Illinois is and whether or not it has the possibility of being read, and my my authority to keep an elections clean will be exercised, and I would suggest that would put Illinois in play in 2024. Uh, so the uh, imp implications nationally, if I'm elected, are, are very easy to point out. And so uh, I would like to think that our, our race is of interest to anybody, any place in the country uh, to, um, to do things that will be helpful to America. Well, thank you, David. And for our firefighters out there, again, you're going to swear an oath to the Constitution. You should know what's in it. Um, check out Dave's book. I'll tweet out a link to his book. And uh, this was a great conversation, something a little bit different than what we normally do. Um, but we, I figured it was a, I figured it was an interesting and fun hour and uh, Dave honored, uh, honored to have you and you have a great day, sir. Uh, Thank you so much, Bob. I was thinking about it. Give my best to Bobby, uh, you know, pass along my best to Bobby. And thank you so much, Frank, for having me. Thank you.